Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Rebecca Creek Baptist Church uh, Mechanics of the Faith Personal Sanctification Class, Week 2. This morning's mechanic or this morning's verb that we're going to discuss is trust. The Bible talks about trust in the Lord with all thine heart. It talks about trust and obey. It talks about trust quite a bit. So we're going to explore that verb. What does that verb mean? When the Bible tells me to trust, how am I supposed to actually do that? Uh, we think we know what some of these words mean, right? For example, pray. That's one of the mechanics of the faith. We think we know what those words mean, but when we break them down, sometimes we realize we're not really doing it the way the scripture defines it. So let's hope this is helpful to you. Last week, we covered abide. We have a total of 13 weeks, 13 weeks. Now, I was asked this morning, how do you get credit for the course, and the answer is simple. If you miss a week, you make up the coursework by taking one of the handouts, and if you don't have one, just let me know, and I'll email a copy of it, and you can complete it online, and if you can't find the class online, I'll give you the answers, and you fill in the blanks, and you've got credit for that week. You can only miss, however, three weeks of in-person classes. If you miss four, we ask you to retake the course because we find that if you're not there personally attending at least 10 out of the 13 weeks, you kind of miss too much to get really thing, anything out of it. So, and don't, be, don't worry if you have to retake a course. Guess what? The courses keep repeating. Eventually, we'll have 10 courses. That's the pastor's vision, to have 10 courses of 13 weeks each. And all I can say to that is I hope somebody helps me write curriculum. <laughs> That's a lot of course content. Um, so anyway, that's the, that's the housekeeping part. Uh, anybody who knows how I teach classes knows that we always start our class with praises. Who has a praise for something God's done in their life this week? Randy. Well, this week, Carol and I celebrated 56 years of marriage. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> I'm just thankful to be alive after these 56 years. Amen. <laughs> Well, you've been married to a wonderful woman for 56 years, brother. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Good morning. Um, I got two brand new great grandbabies. Two brand new great grandbabies. Wow. <laughs> Amen. And healthy and everything's good? Great. Praise the Lord for that. Sir. Still clean and sober. Still clean and sober. One day at a time, as they say, right, brother? Right. God is able. Amen. 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 That's worth applauding. <laughs> Amen. Who else has a praise this morning? Anyone? Good morning. Amen. You don't miss certain things until you don't have them. Like, I cut my thumb, and that doesn't sound like much, but you ever try to get dressed and tie a tie when you don't have a thumb? <laughs> that was an adventure. <laughs> so, yeah, but your eyes are kind of important, amen? <laughs> amen. Well, praise the Lord for that. Um, Ken Baker, will you open us in a word of prayer? Amen. So this morning, the topic is trust. Now, trust. Trust is the characteristic word in the Old Testament. And you're going to find that this, course, this class today has lots and lots of scripture in it. But you're also going to find that the vast majority of the scripture that we're going to read is from the Old Testament. And the vast majority of that is from the book of Psalms. Because the Psalms are all about trust. If you read and study and pray over the Psalms, you realize that one of the reasons God said David was a man after his own heart is because David trusted the Lord with everything in his life. 
Uh, the terms for trust, faith, and believe are somewhat synonymous, but they do have their differences. There are several Hebrew words or phrases in the Old Testament that are rendered as trust in our English Old Testament. Now, these Hebrew words mean to take refuge in, take refuge in, to flee for protection, to lean upon, to rely upon, to wait for, and to have hope. That Hebrew word is translated by all of these English phrases multiple times throughout the Old Testament. Now, here are some examples of how the word trust is used in the Old Testament. Psalm 2.12. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and ye perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. And then Job 13.15. Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him, but I will maintain mine own ways before him. And then Psalm 25, too. O oh my God, I trust in thee. Let me not be ashamed. Let not mine enemies triumph over me. And then Isaiah 26, 4. Trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. You're going to see a picture in every time the word trust is used in the Old Testament rely upon, lean upon, and trust in the Lord. Why? Because he can be trusted. Because he's worthy of your trust and of your dependence. Uh, if I lean on a half-broken-down wall, the studs of which are pulling up out of the floor and aren't even connected to the ceiling joists, that wall might fall. That's an unworthy wall for me to lean upon. But I believe upon the rock, which is God, who's unmovable and unshakable, I have a safe foundation to lean upon. There are also several Greek words that are rendered trust in our New Testament. Now, these Greek words combined, they mean as follows. They're translated with these English words. Expect, confide, convince, conciliate or reconcile to assent to, to rely upon by inward certainty. I love that one. To rely upon by inward certainty. To give credence to, that means to give weight to something. To think of it as worthy of, of, of a gravity of weight. To have conviction of, to have faith in, to entrust, to commit to, and to have confidence in. Now, here are some examples of how the word trust or trusted is used in the New Testament. Ephesians 1.13, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, by the way, that word believed and that word trusted, same Greek word, believed and trusted, same Greek word. After that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. 2 Corinthians 1.9, but we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God, which raiseth the dead. And then Philippians 2.19, but I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timotheus shortly unto you, that I also may be of good comfort when I know your state. That means I am convinced and persuaded that God is going to make this happen. And then 1 Thessalonians 2, 4. But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God which trieth our hearts. Now that references taking custody or stewardship of something. God has committed to you a trust, if you will. You ever heard the term trust fund? Right? That's the idea. 1 Timothy 4.10. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. So we see clearly in both the Old Testament and the New Testament that we are to trust in the Lord. This is not a suggestion. This command is throughout Scripture. What does it mean to trust in the Lord? Now, there are far too many aspects to trust to cover in one single lesson, but we're going to explore several of them this morning. 
First, we're going to look at trust as it relates to salvation. What does it take to trust the Lord for salvation? What does that mean? What does that look like? And then second, we're going to look at trust as it relates to the Christian life. So let's talk about regarding salvation first. First, we trust in the Lord when we receive Christ as our Savior and are born again. That's one of the definitions of the word trust. The word trust means to receive as a honored guest or visitor. We lean upon the Lord only to save us, recognizing that we cannot be saved by religion, self-effort, or good works. When we trust completely in the Lord to save us, relying only on him, this is really important, we are saved. Galatians 2.16, someone read that for us. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. That's pretty clear. Pretty clear. Someone read Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 for us. Very famous verses. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, so that any man should boast. And then Galatians 2, 21. I do not trust that it's the grace of God, for it is just righteousness come by the law, but in Christ is dead. Christ is dead in vain. Now the Baptist preacher Edward Mote, he expressed this idea very well in his song, The Solid Rock, which happens to be my favorite hymn. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust, lean on, the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. It's not Jesus plus something. It's not Jesus plus, well, I got to live it. I got to live a good life. And if I sin too much, I might lose it. And if I don't get baptized, then who knows what's going to happen. No, that's not salvation. What are you trusting for your salvation? To trust Christ for salvation means just that. To trust only in Christ. He is the all-sufficient one. It is not trust in Christ plus something else, whether it be good works or baptism, or confirmation, or dedication, or sinlessness, or whatever, because by definition, to trust in something is to wholly lean upon or rely upon it and nothing else. When you go up to a skyscraper and you take the elevator to the 82nd floor, you're trusting that that building is going to stay standing and that that elevator is going to take you to the top. When you get on any elevator, really, you're trusting that cable (laughs) that it won't break. You don't try to partially climb the stairs while you're taking the elevator. It doesn't work that way. Second, when we trust the Lord for salvation, we're taking refuge in him. Now, that's another definition of the word trust, to take refuge refuge. That's used commonly throughout the Old Testament. The refuge is from the penalty of sin, which is eternal separation from God in torment or hell. 1 Thessalonians 1.10, someone read that for us. He delivered us from the wrath to come. And friend, let me tell you something. If you don't know it, there is wrath to come. It's coming. God is just, and he will not be mocked. And what's going on in our world today is a mockery of God. And the judgment and wrath of God is coming, and you need to find a way to escape it. And the escape is the shelter and the refuge of Jesus Christ. Notice that this deliverance from God's wrath is expressed in the past tense. It's already an accomplished fact. Those who have trusted Christ have already been delivered from the wrath to come. Well, if I sin too much, I might be subject to wrath. No, you've already been delivered from the wrath to come. It's a past accomplished fact. 
the moment you receive Christ as your Savior. Someone read for us Hebrews 6.18. We who have fled for refuge to lay, upon a, lay hold upon the hope set before us. Amen? Number third, number three, the third. When we trust the Lord for salvation, we're taking him at his word, believing it as trustworthy. The word trust and the word trustworthy are synonymous in many ways. I place trust in something that is trustworthy. We're showing conviction of, in this definition, and having faith in the promise of God that we can be saved when we place our faith in him. 2 Timothy 1.12 says, For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Amen. The word translated persuaded in this verse doesn't just mean Paul was won over by an argument or words. Like, well, you've persuaded me to come over to your side. That's not what we're talking about. It's an inward conviction of moral certainty. It, if, if you were to try to translate it into modern English, you would say, I am absolutely convinced. That's a little different than persuaded. It means he's completely convinced or has a deep conviction. His conviction is a result of comprehending what? the trustworthiness of God. Hey, I put my soul in the trust of Jehovah God. And you know what I believe about that? He's able to do whatever with, with my soul, preserve it till the end. Mm -hmm. Romans 10, 17 says, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Someone read for us 1 Peter 1, 23 to 25. So we're born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible by the word of God. And that word of God is the means by which the gospel is preached to us. We're relying upon the promises of the word of God. Notice the emphasis that our faith, our trust, is based on God's promises in his word. We're taking his word as reliable, placing our entire confidence behind it. Well, uh, just invite Jesus into your heart. Well, that's not salvation. Salvation is trusting Christ with your eternal soul, turning from your sin to faith in Christ, realizing you cannot save yourself, and saying what Peter said when he was sinking while walking on the water, Lord, save me. And he does. It's been said that the trust involved in salvation may be likened to a parachute. One can believe, intellectually assent, that the parachute would work and allow them to survive if they jumped out of an airplane. I believe that parachutes work. Intellectually speaking, I know that to be true. But guess what I've never done? <laughs> I've never taken the leap. That's the difference. The one who trusts in the parachute is the one who actually takes the leap. Now, trust regarding the Christian life. So we've looked at salvation, and uh, we'll be real brief on that compared to what we're dealing with the other part, which is regarding the Christian life. So you're, you're born again. You've placed your faith in Christ. You've trusted in him entirely for your salvation. Is that where trust ends? No. Our trust in Christ doesn't end at our salvation. This initial trust is only the beginning of our journey, where we daily learn to trust him more as we grow 
in our knowledge of him. So in what way does the Christian, the saved person, trust Christ in their daily life? We're going to go back to those initial definitions of those Greek and Hebrew words to help us understand. So number one, first, a Christian trusts the Lord when they commit to him daily. They commit to him daily to live a holy and obedient life, recognizing that they cannot do so under their own power. How many of you have figured out that you cannot live the Christian life under your own power and your own self-effort? Can't do it. Can't do it. But I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. This produces spiritual growth and progress in sanctification. Someone uh, read for us Psalm 37.5. See there? Commit thy way, trust also in him. And in James 4, 8. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Amen. And then Romans 12, 1 and 2, very famous verses. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. It's important to note that in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, the use of the word trust, particularly in Romans 12, it's not a one-time thing. That is not the tense of the Greek at all. When it says, present your body a living sacrifice, it means to daily and continually present your body a living sacrifice. It's not a one-time event. You're supposed to trust God every single day. How do you start your day? How do you live your day? How do you end your day? Second, a Christian trusts the Lord when they wait for and confide in him daily in prayer. Now, one of the verbs we're going to study in the mechanics of the faith is actually the word wait. So I don't want to steal the thunder from that lesson here, but one of the ways we trust God is to wait for him and his good time in answering our prayer. We develop an intimate and personal prayer life with the Lord in which the believer shares their very heart with God. Someone read for us Psalm 27, 14. Wait on the Lord, be of good cheer, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, and wait. Uh, When something's repeated in Scripture, what does that mean? That means there's emphasis. They really want, listen up. Let me give you a key to the Christian life, the author says. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage. He will strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Isaiah 40, 31 says, But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Someone read 1 Peter 5, 7 for us. Well, there's this problem I have, Lord, that I'm going to cast it upon you. Is that what it says? Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Jesus doesn't want to take some of your burden. Jesus doesn't want to take 22.5% of your burden. Jesus wants you to cast all your care upon him as he cares for you. The Christian life is a life of the realization of your absolute dependence upon Jesus Christ. Third, a Christian trusts in the Lord when they flee for protection to him when temptation or fear or persecution or hardship is encountered. Psalm 91, verses 1 and 2 says, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God. In Him will I trust. It's a safe refuge. And then Psalm 23, 1. Who can quote it? Don't even look at your page. 
There you go. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I don't have to worry about anything. He's my shepherd. And then Psalm 46, verses 1 and 2. Someone read that for us. That's, uh, that's trust. A very present help in trouble. He is our what? He's our refuge as well as our strength. And then Psalm 56.3 says, What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. Psalm 56.11 says, In God I have put my trust. I will not be afraid what man can do unto me. Man, I love that verse. Believers are sometimes criticized by unbelievers with the charge that they are using God as a crutch or using God as a shield to protect you. You, you, can't, you can't stand on your own two feet. You guys feel like you have to lean on this Jesus, guilty as charged. And I'm unashamed to say it, all right? Whoops. The lost think that they can somehow stand on their own two feet and that they don't need God without ever realizing that they're all one moment, one breath away from potential disaster. This week, a dear friend and a former coworker passed away. I was notified of it a couple of days ago. He was 40 years old. You're one breath away from eternity. They think, the world thinks, they're in charge. They got it all under control. And that those Christians, those are just weaklings who lean on this imaginary character up in heaven to support their life. They have no clue what they're talking about. What is your life, James says? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and vanisheth away. Believers, oops, I'm going the wrong way. Fourth, a Christian trusts the Lord when they give faithfully to his work through the local church, entrusting their finances and their material needs to him. Entrusting your finances and material needs to him. You know, people hire expert financial advisors and investment counselors and bankers and stockbrokers. You know who should be your number one financial advisor? The Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, I trust Jesus with all my heart. Okay, friend, do you trust him with your money? Do you? Do you trust him with your finances? Do you trust him with your budget? Do you trust him with your tithes and your offerings? Do you trust him with your support for missions and reaching the lost for Jesus Christ? This, my friend, is where the rubber often meets the road for many Christians. We like to pay lip service to trust, but we need to demonstrate trust. Malachi 3.10 says... Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. I can't tell you how many times people have asked me, how do you live on that percentage after you give so much to the church? I said, friend, I live better tithing than I ever lived without tithing. God pours out the windows of heaven as a blessing. We can attest to that over 26 years of marriage. Time and time again, the Lord is reliable when we trust him with our finances. 2 Corinthians 9, 6, someone read that for us. Amen to that. And then Matthew 6.24 from the Sermon on the Mount. That last part of that verse, you should burn it into your memory. You cannot serve God and money. Can't do it. Got to serve one or the other. Are you chasing the almighty dollar? Are you chasing after the righteousness and holiness that comes from faith and living for Jesus Christ? What do you strive for? 
in your life. Matthew 6.33 says famously, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things, material things, shall be added unto you. God knows, Jesus says, that you need food. He knows that. He's smart enough to know that. He created you. He knows you need water. He knows you need shelter. He knows you need clothing. He knows you need all those things. But Jesus says to the believer, after all those things do the Gentiles seek. That's their life focus. Chasing the almighty dollar. What's your focus? Seek ye first the kingdom of God. That's trust. Fifth, a Christian trusts in the Lord when they seek reconciliation. Now, that word trust means to be reconciled. Remember, that's one of the definitions. To trust is to be reconciled. So when we seek reconciliation with the Lord by confessing and repenting of our sin, we are trusting in the Lord. 1 John 1.9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Someone read Proverbs 28, 13 for us. You want to prosper, Christian? You want to prosper? Don't cover them. Confess them and forsake them, and you'll have mercy. And then Hosea 6, 1. Someone read that for us. Right, so we have here the chastisement of the Lord, and we have the reconciliation and healing of the Lord. By the way, the Lord doesn't tear and the Lord doesn't smite the unbeliever. Not in this context. This is talking about believers who have strayed away from God and God has chastised them. Why does God chastise them? Because he wants to bind you up. He wants to heal you of your iniquity. He wants you to come back to him and be restored and reconciled to the proper relationship. And then Psalm 32, 5, someone read that. David was bowled over by that. He was astonished that I recognized my sins. I came to you, Lord. I confessed them and repented, and you forgave me. Isn't that a joyful thing? Aren't you glad that God forgives when we confess sin? When God says he will forgive when we confess and forsake our sin, we trust him when we take him at his word. Now, as hard as it is to believe, Many Christians today have fallen away from God and remain in a life of sin because they actually do not believe God will forgive them if they humbly come to him and seek his forgiveness. Oh, no, I've, I've gone too far. I've gone too far. You don't know. See, you're just like, you, you're, you're one of the people that stays close to God, and you might have some piddly little sin, but my sin, whoop, it's too deep for that. Wrong. That's just wicked, evil thinking, and it smears the character of God. They're confused about God's nature, and they think that he thinks like we think. Well, you know, I'm ready to forgive you, brother, but you've done this to me 27 times, and 27 times is enough. 28, I've reached my limit. Does God work that way? God doesn't work that way. Our God upbraideth not, the Bible says. We can come to him with anything and have full trust that he will forgive us as he promised to forgive us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
all of it. Sixth, a Christian trusts the Lord when they give credence. That's another one of those definitions we made in the very beginning. When they give credence or weight, gravitas, to his word, and they strive to obey the word of God, regardless of the contemporary culture or the opinion of man. What do you put your weight upon? What do you trust in, the word of man or the word of God? The direction of the popular culture or the direction of God's word? Psalm 20, verse 7 says, some trust in chariots and some in horses. Today we would say, some trust in their big house in the Dominion and their Lamborghini. But we will remember the name of the Lord our God. That's the difference between the one who trusts and the one who does not. Someone read for us uh, 1 Peter 1, 14 to 16. Amen. Not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance. You're not ignorant anymore, Christian. God has opened your eyes. Amen. Ephesians 4, 20 through 24 reads, But ye have not so learned Christ, if so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Seventh, a Christian trusts in the Lord when they rely upon by inward certainty. Remember, that was one of the definitions. When they rely upon by inward certainty the promises God makes in his word, and when they apply the word to, the, to their life. This is applying God's word to your life. Pastor preaches about that a lot. Anybody who's ever sat under the, the, the preaching of Pastor James Lyon, whoever knows, he puts an emphasis on not just hearing the word of God, but applying the word of God to your life. And that's where this is, when we rely upon it by an inward certainty and live it out. Isaiah 26, 3 says, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. What do you think about? What do you contemplate? What do you emphasize in your daily life? And then Psalm 37, verses 23 and 24. Someone read that for us. Right. There's only so, how, so, how, so far down you can go because the Lord upholds you with his hand. And in Psalm 119, 105, the famous word, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Eighth, a Christian trusts in the Lord when their hope in the Lord is not shaken by hard times, by tragedy, by loss, and by heartache. Because they recognize God is still caring for them and that all things are working together for good. Romans 8, 28 says, and we know, do you know? <laughs> do you know that? That all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. If you know Christ, you are the called according to his purpose. And all things in your life, whether they're good, whether they're bad, whether they're pleasant or unpleasant, whether they're tragic or joyful, world, they will work together for good to those who love God because we are the called according to his purpose. And then Job 13, 15 says, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. And then Jeremiah 17, verses 7 and 8, blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is. You see that word hope and trust are sometimes used interchangeably. 
For he shall be as a tree planted by the waters, and that spreadeth out her roots by the river, and shall not see when heat cometh, but her leaf shall be green, and shall not be careful in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. What does that remind you of? What other passage of Scripture? Psalm 1, right? And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Ultimately, trusting in the Lord is a behavior which is cultivated by practice. I don't learn to trust God with every aspect of my life overnight. I learn to trust him more and more each day as I practice trusting him. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I've proved him or and or. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. These songs we sing, they'll teach you if you let them. The more you trust in the Lord in the circumstances and events of your life today, the more you'll be ready to trust in the Lord when the circumstances change. And, and who here can vouch for the fact that circumstances change? <laughs> and trust, like so many other things, comes down to obedience. You're going to see this as a common theme throughout these 13 weeks as we study the mechanics of the faith that they almost all boil down to obedience to the word of God. But when a Christian says, I trust the Lord, but they're really saying they do not trust him at all. The believer who trusts the Lord does not qualify their answer. The Lord is their first refuge and their first thought, especially when times get tough or illness, or tragedy, or trial comes. What is your immediate reaction when terrible news comes your way? That's a good test. That's a really good test. <laughs> Ultimately, the believer who trusts in the Lord is acknowledging what? What are we acknowledging when we trust in the Lord? That God is good. And that therefore he will never allow anything into the life of the believer that is not for his or her ultimate good. We don't have to worry about it. To not trust in God is to cast doubt on his goodness, his ability, his promises, and it's to cast doubt on his very nature. Now let's take the words of Solomon to his son in Proverbs 3 as our final thought on what it means to trust. Someone read for us to close Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Now that, friends, is a great definition of trust. All right. Hope this was a blessing to you. Thank you to those who are joined us online this morning. Um, <laughs> Mike Eck, will you close us in a word of prayer? Absolutely. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for your message today and your word. Lord, thank you for um, Robert and his ability to uh, be a vessel of, of your message, Lord. Thank you for that. And it resonate in our hearts. Amen. Thank you, guys.